The Quiet Warrior Show, where we help top leaders find their pathway to incredible success and a lifetime of happiness. Here is your host, Tom Dutta, The Quiet Warrior. Well, welcome to The Quiet Warrior Show. My name is Tom Dutta. I am The Quiet Warrior. Excited to have back on the show again, Mr. Scott McDonald. Hey, Scott, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Tom. Yeah, it's awesome to have you back. It's rare that I have somebody coming back twice, but you you mesmerized me the first time, and <laughs> here you are. I want to just start off by mentioning that before I, I turn it back to you, that uh, for the audience who haven't heard the first episode, we'll, we'll be releasing it in the near future. Uh, you want to catch that one as well. It's uh, it's based on a book uh, Scott wrote called Think Like a Dog, Stole My Heart, and I think you'll want to read or listen to that and read that book. And uh, recently, I was just saying to Scott offline that I was enjoying some of his uh, pictures he shared on social media about an amazing trip. So this is a man who not only has a lot to teach us, but enjoys life. And let's get going and ask you, Scott, to tell us a bit about yourself. Well, I... uh, uh I've got a, a background in real estate, and I've worked uh, in almost every state in the country, most cities, and a lot of foreign countries, uh, working on large commercial real estate projects, and then um, fixing projects that were broken led to fixing companies that are broken, and so I became kind of a global corporate turnaround guy, and, uh, and spent most of my career doing that. Oh, that's fantastic. I just want to mention that Scott lives in Del Mar, California, a beautiful part of uh, the world. I, I'm up here in Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, so we feel like we're so close. The, the, the fact that you were a turnaround CEO, and uh, you're very humble about it, but for those uh, who don't know what a turnaround CEO is, it's a, it's a rewarding job, but it's also a job where you put your life and you put your reputation and everything on the line to do a job. And sometimes when you step into that world, you don't know what you're going to find. And the reason why I connected to you at a soul level is my background is being a corporate CEO. I've been in several of those situations and, and sat in a chair where I found things that, you know, maybe weren't dealt with before and I had to clean it up. Or perhaps I stepped into a world where a recession hit and all of a sudden what happened in the past, the rules changed and you literally had this organization and you were in the penthouse, you had all the layers below the structure starting to crumble in some way. And you realize when you get in there that there's people and lives that you're responsible for. It's an incredible job. There's a lot of adrenaline that goes through you when you're in that type of a role. I want to start there. And the book Saving Investor was fascinating to me. So everybody, I'm going to ask Scott to get us into that story. Scott, take us back there. First of all, Investor was a company, I think it was during the financial crisis. Uh, there was a connection to companies like Morgan Stanley. You were based in the United States living somewhere and all this changed. Uh, tell us about the beginning of that story. Well, if we go back right before the financial crisis, uh, kind of the the uh, economic peak was 2007, uh, and uh, uh, Morgan Stanley had put together a private equity fund, uh, which uh, went out and bought companies, and it, it bought companies using mostly debt. Uh, and as a result, uh, uh, if, if things worked out, um, the, uh, the financial returns were exorbitantly high. And no one really anticipated things would not work out well because back in 2007, it was kind of the end of a long expansion and things did seem to work out generally. And so uh, the subsidiary of Morgan Stanley bought a public company in Australia called uh, the Investa uh, Property Group. Uh, it was a large acquisition. It was about $6.5 billion. And uh, they used $4.5 billion of debt and they guaranteed a lot of the debt so they could borrow even more money. And then what happened is uh, 2008 came along and, and it began the crash with Bear Stearns and, and Lehman Brothers and pressure on Morgan Stanley, whether they were gonna survive. And they have this four and a half billion dollar debt out there and, and going into the financial crisis. So I was asked, 
by uh, Morgan Stanley to go look at this company and give them some advice uh, and, uh, as to what to do. And they're pretty nervous about it. I uh, went there with a couple others for a week. And uh, my commitment to them was to stay one week, meet with the CEO, meet with some of the key employees, meet with some uh, lenders, and give them some advice. And uh, I left about five and a half years later. So it was uh, <laughs> kind of an unexpected uh, uh, longer term uh, commitment. But it, that's what happened. Yeah, I mean, we're not going to say you outstayed your welcome. I think many people there with the work that was done appreciated the fact that you stayed that long. So let's get into that. I mean, there's going to be people listening to the show and why I wanted to create a legacy for this and you is we know that the next generations coming up, the, the Gen X, Gen Y, millennials, those that are younger than some of us are going to run the world. They're going to run companies and uh, the old school. Sometimes you hear, Scott, or I've heard the term of the first hundred days, there's books written on it. Uh, first 100 days when you get into a new company as a CEO, what do you do? There's different trains of thought. You make a lot of change fast or maybe you sit back and you observe and you take your time. Uh, But all of that's now thrown out the window. The world has changed. In fact, 10 years from now, we don't even know what technology in the world is going to look like. And uh, speed is a factor. But also there's this big thing called trust and communication where uh, the generations that we're we're leading now, uh, they don't like the old bosses. So take us into the book. Give us some lessons learned. I mean, if you if we walk into that job, take us back. What were the things you held as priority in the first 30 days? Well, you have to understand what's there. And uh, you can look at financial reports from afar. Uh, you can talk to investment people who made the investment. But um, you really need to be on the ground, uh, in the office, walking the floors, talking to people to just understand what was there to, uh, before you can start making changes. And so I went there. I was concerned because I was an American, and American CEOs are not well liked in Australia. And I think this is true of foreign companies companies generally, they resent the fact that a CEO comes in from another country because that means that that the investors don't think that there is somebody in the local countries capable of doing the job. So there's an automatic resentment. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, but I spent the first month just walking the floors, talking to people, understanding who did what and why, and what were the strengths of the company, and what were the weaknesses of the company. And where was the money? How did the money flow? And trying to get an impression. And one of the first impressions I got is that the company was was burning money at a very fast pace. Our our largest division was an office division, and they were losing $10 million a month in cash. So we were going to run out of money. At the same time we were running out of money, um, we were hiring new employees. And that was very perplexing to me. And it was because there were lots of different siloed divisions, which were not connected to the overall picture. So there was a a funds group that was raising money for from uh, small investors, and they were hiring more staff uh, to deal with uh, small investors. At the same time, we were, we weren't able to pay our bills. And so just understanding all of that was the critical uh, first step. And, um, and I think sometimes people go in and try to make changes fast because they see the, uh, the ultimate outcome is not, not going to be desirable, but, but you have to understand what you have before you can go in and change anything. And, and my conclusion was we had a, a, uh, an advantageous uh, market position in the office area and in land development. uh, And we had the ability to raise institutional funds and everything else was superfluous. Um, And and, uh, so I put together a game plan and talked to the investors about it. And it meant uh, going from, uh, I think we had, I'm going to get this wrong, but it was like 600 and some employees down to 200 and some employees. Wow. Um, but, but a lot of it was selling off 
divisions and entities. So it wasn't firing 400 people, although I, I did have to have to fire quite a number. But it was um, just winnowing it down to what is potentially the profitable areas and the areas where we had a competitive advantage and getting rid of everything else. Uh, and that was hard because companies love to grow. Employees love to grow. Uh, they like to be part of big companies that are expanding. But this was a company that was expanding while losing money. And every, every time they bolted more stuff on, they lost more money. And <laughs> nobody was nobody was keeping track. So that was that was a problem. Yeah, that's pretty fascinating. It's probably not the only story like that 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 you can tell. I, mean, I know from my own experience that the the higher you get in a company away from the front lines, you lose touch. And, you know, I, I have a, a, a friend who was a former CEO of a local company here, and I won't get into the details on it, but I want to tell you that when you went down into the company and talked to people on the front lines about the company, there were people who thought the company was doing incredibly well. They were celebrating, you know, they were going out buying cars and putting mortgages on their homes based on the fact that they felt secure. But as you got higher up to the top, there was such a disconnect you know, the, the really, the, the company wasn't operating, effectively was in trouble. Uh, I want to talk about something, and this came to me in the last interview about you, Scott, and just something that you have innately, and I read it in the book, so expand on that, about your, first of all, the trust issue. Here you were, and you said, an American, not always trusted, and you go into a new company, and, you know, you have to earn the trust quickly, I like your opinion on that, but there's there's talking through the head, facts and figures, and you know, some CEOs will go in and they'll just say, this is my way and these are the facts. And then others have the ability to connect to the heart through emotions, which is really the path that science says is where you can get people to say, you know what, we need to change. I read some things in your book about that. You know, tell us how you led people and influenced them through that period. Yeah, in my mind, uh, leadership is the ability to inspire people to work harder than they normally would and do things and accomplish things that they normally could not do. A CEO is one person. One person can, cannot make all the decisions and cannot implement all the activities. You need employees to do that and you need to inspire and lead employees. And the challenge when you are um, downsizing is leading employees um, to buy into a new a new paradigm. And so it means uh, you spend a lot of time with employees, with management, working on things, listening to opinions, um, making sure everybody has an input, being honest with everybody, telling them what's really going on, and and try to avoid the, um, the look that you feel you're better than anybody and, uh, and people need to work for you because you're the boss as opposed to people want to work because they're part of the team that's going to make things happen. The, 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 it's funny, the first week I was talking to the uh, head of our HR department and she said, uh, hey, you've really impressed people around here. And I said, well, what have I done? I've only been there a week. She said, you use the, the main employee bathroom. <laughs> I said, well, 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 what else would I use? <laughs> and she said, well, the ex-CEO had a personal bathroom and uh, he had a palatial office that was uh, in the back and not connected to the main uh, floor. And I moved into an office right on the main floor. So employees automatically thought, oh, he seems like kind of a normal guy. Maybe we can get <laughs> to know him as opposed to the impervious uh, uh, CEO that preceded me. Oh, that's so I'm, I'm laughing with you. I, mean, I think that's a teaching moment on the show, everybody. And here you, heart, you heard it first from Scott using the employee bathroom. But these are the small things that we don't think about as CEOs that can make a difference to the people. They're not written in the MBA uh, journals or books. You know, you have to have this innate ability to be able to say, how am I going to be seen as just like them? So that's fantastic. I want to ask you about the the whole uh, uh, scary part of this. I read in the book, and I just don't remember the specifics. I know you'll remind me. But let me just start with a, a, a parallel. Uh, I love watch a lot of movies. There's a movie called Saving Private Ryan with Tom Hanks. Um, very hard movie to watch, done by Spielberg about the war. And there's a scene in that yeah. that's never, never been lost on me, Scott, where, where uh, there's no air cover. He has to direct 100 men to take this hill. He already knows that 80% of them will be killed. 
Uh, yet he stands up with courage and honor and says, men, we're going to take that hill. I'm going to lead you. And uh, after they do it, and he loses a bunch of guys, but they actually take the hill. He goes behind a, a rock, takes off his helmet, and he starts weeping. He starts crying, and he gets that out. Well, CEOs, and I call it CEO cracking emotionally often, we have the highest level of pressure. There's a whole mental health angle here. Was there a time in the company where you were facing the wall where it's like you, you, you knew that maybe it wasn't going to work or there was a big risk? And uh, how did you overcome that personally, mentally, and still get people to follow you? Yeah, there was, there was not a time where I concluded it wasn't going to work. Um, there were many, many days when I realized that the odds were significantly against us. Um, Australia has a, a particular set of rules. They do not have a chapter 13 uh, or chapter 11 rather, uh, where you can declare bankruptcy and restructure. They, they don't have that. Um, uh, so if you fail to pay a bill, um, the, the, the lenders just come in and take over the company and liquidate. And if you knowingly um, continue when you should have declared insolvency, you as a director are personally liable for the expenses incurred by the company. And in this case, we had four and a half billion dollars of debt. And so uh, everything from the newspaper uh, subscription, whatever, was potentially personally liable to me. So it was a pretty scary time. Uh, and I had outside counsel I met with uh, almost every week and I would ask them, are we technically insolvent? And the answer was never yes or no. It was, well, it depends. It depends on if you reasonably think you're going to be able to pay your bills. Well, that didn't give, give me a lot of comfort. But yeah, yeah, I would say it was a daily occurrence almost where I would think through, are we going to make it? And I was just determined and I never concluded we wouldn't make it. Um, but, but there were a lot of uh, challenging, difficult days. Yeah, thank you for sharing that and being of what I what I see as vulnerability, which is a trait of a great CEO. You know, I won't regurgitate the last interview, but everybody, you need to listen to it because, Scott, you paid the price and some might say the ultimate price through this journey because it has an impact on family and things that are attached to you. I know when I did my first turnaround assignment, it was an American company and I went around a Canadian, uh, the Canadian division of it. It was a $290 billion market cap company. And uh, I had the Canadian side of it. And uh, I remember when I took it over, it was such a mess. The president had been fired. Customers were leaving. Lawsuits, all these things going on. I didn't really know what a CEO was. It was my first one. And, uh, and for a year, I ran it on my back, meaning I had to literally deal with things and uh, lost a lot of time with family. My daughter was born. I was traveling on an airplane. So that whole thing got out of balance. Uh, just give us some advice on self-care if you're... You know, if you're a turnaround CEO if to the other ones that are like you, uh, how do you maintain your strength so that you can finish the job while others maybe are crumbling uh, around you? Yeah, you got to have a commitment. I mean, it is a 24-7 commitment. Um, and that's really tough because it doesn't leave a lot of time for other things. Now, I've done restructuring. Um, with family and and when my kids were younger and I had to do some corporate restructuring, I would try to make sure I was home for dinner every single night um, and and spent time with the kids and school and then I would go back basically to work or go into the study and, and work later at night after the kids were in bed so you you got to spend time with family now with the Australian assignment um my uh, wife of 30 years did not want to go to Australia and uh and she wound up filing for divorce um so that was a that was a price paid now had i not gone to australia would the outcome have been different i don't know um but it was hard it was very hard um so uh yeah you only have so much energy and so much time and um and, and, and when you get involved in um, uh, kind of restructuring it, it, it takes a little bit of a toll. 
Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I mean, that's the part about the resilience in your story. And I think that's why I want to talk about the book a bit now. I mean, people need to read this book. If you're a new up and coming CEO or you aspire to be one and you're wondering, you know, why, why do CEOs get paid so much? What is it like to be this turnaround or fix it type of CEO? You know, you got to read this book. Scott, the book, the book is called Saving Investa. I know it was published in 2016. I read it from cover to cover, highly rated it. I recommend it. Uh, tell us why you wrote that book and uh, give us a nugget from it that, that is the reason why you think people should pick it up and read it. Yeah, um, it's very rare to have somebody write a book about what is going on behind the scenes with a private equity company. Um, there are lots of uh, confidentiality agreements um, and, and the private equity companies really don't want the information um, provided. Now, I signed a contract with Investa, not with Morgan Stanley. And so, um, and I shared everything as I was writing the book with, with Investa, and Morgan Stanley knew about it. But at the end, um, there were, uh, they weren't too happy that the book was going to be published because they didn't want the all the information uh, shared. And so there were issues there that we finally got through, but it, it delayed the publication by about a year. Uh, while this was going on, while we were trying to uh, refinance debt and Morgan Stanley was under a lot of pressure and this is public information. Um, they came within a day of insolvency themselves during the heart of the, the uh, financial crisis. And because a lot of the debt was guaranteed, uh, if, if the company had failed, uh, it probably would have led, in my judgment, to a failure of their funds division, and it might have pushed the bank over the edge. Uh, that, that would be my opinion, and it's, uh, I'm sure there others might disagree. But it, it clearly was a, a very tense time uh, for the bank. And the last thing they needed was a was a multi billion dollar default, uh, and then the bank was very active in what was happening. And, excuse me, the the the, the dog is. Uh, yeah, that's okay. That's why we love my life. <laughs> my co-author in the other book is barking, so uh, uh, let me move somewhere else. Um, so anyhow, the 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 stakes were huge. Um, and uh, and and I wrote the book, and it's a behind-the-scenes look at what was happening. And uh, it's a, it's an unusual book. It's been used, by the way, as a case study uh, at Indiana University's Kelly Business School, and I think it's been used as a case study in other schools. But I, I thought sharing the 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 drama yeah. of what happens behind the scenes was something that is not normally done for for uh, legal reasons. Well, thank you for sharing that. And by the way, we're not going to edit out Sadie. I got to tell you that yeah. one, of the re- one of the reasons I love live uh, interviews like this and for everybody to know is Scott wrote another book called uh, uh, Think Like a Dog based on finding this dog Sadie and through the eyes of the dog learning how dogs think and applying that maybe as lessons in life and business. Fascinating read, very entertaining. So you need to get that one too. But here's the thing, when you're a CEO or a leader at a company, if Sadie happens, I mean, you'll be sitting in your office and something comes at you, you got to shift gears. And we just saw Scott, you know, he didn't panic. He didn't start freaking out. He got up, he moved away from the, the, the barking. He knew that Sadie was going to eventually stop. He was composed. And that's a, that, that's a skill. That just takes the the experience that Scott has. So, Scott, I want to I want to actually honor you with a, a few words here. We've done this before. These may be new ones. Uh, these are leadership words. Based on what you've said and what I hear from you, I've written these down as we talk uh, to honor you. The first one is resilience. There's no question about it. When you read Scott's book, you'll get that uh, courage uh, to step into that world and do what he did, uh, pay the price he did. Uh, peaceful. You know this already because I think I've told you, but there's something about the way you speak and the calmness from you. Uh, even we saw it with Sadie starting to bark that actually when you're in a company that's in difficulty. You need a leader who can maintain that demeanor. And the last one is uh, wisdom, or I might use the word maven. Uh, Math, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book talks about mavens. These are people who, who are go-to people when you need somebody who's an expert. Well, 
turn around, fix it guy. You know, that's you, Scott. So I'm going to give it back to you as we wrap this up. It's been such an honor again talking to you. Tell us where people can get the book. And I know that some of the proceeds go to this incredible foundation that you've created. So tell us about that. Yeah, well, the book is Saving Investa, I-N-V-E-S-T-A, How an Ex-Factory Worker Helped Save One of Australia's Icon- Iconic Companies. Um, you can buy it at all the normal st- sources. Amazon has it. Barnes & Noble has it. Um, uh, it's in paperback. It was an ebook. The ebook files have gotten misplaced through a bankruptcy filing on behalf of the publisher, but now another publisher has picked up the distribution. So it's, so the book is available. Um, and uh, one of the points that has gotten quite a bit of play is the last chapter are um, basically uh, recommendations uh, and, and, and findings from my life. Um, and and, 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 and uh, when I was negotiating with one of the Morgan Stanley executives about the release of the book, uh, they were pretty hard at negotiating because they, they were reluctant to have any of this made public. But, but at the end, when we had the last meeting and we agreed, um, he said, look, uh, the last chapter where you give recommendations on how people should, should lead their business life, I gave to my daughter who is a college and said, this is the best uh, chapter I've ever read in terms of recommending how to, how to move forward with your career. Um, so I thought that was pretty good because he was my adversary the whole time. And then he was recommending <laughs> the book to his, his family. <laughs> I, I love that. And I do remember that, that part of the book. So everybody, you need to get that. And uh, you have the McDonald's scholarship or scholarships through, through McDonald's Scholars. So there is a purpose behind some of the, the money that we pay for that book that helps others. Uh, Scott, thank you for doing that. We look forward to talking to you again. And uh, leave us with your final words. Uh, well, well, Tom, it's, it's an honor for me because uh, you clearly have a, a great reputation as a turnaround guy yourself, and I've read your books, uh, and I've been really impressed. So um, it's an honor to... Uh, to, to talk to you and, uh, and your distinguished background. And, uh, yeah, uh, if anybody has any further questions or needs to contact me, I have a website, author dot com, and it talks about the various books and, uh, there's another book coming out next year and we'll maybe talk when that happens. I can't wait. Can't wait to read it too. Well, everybody find this show on your favorite podcast, uh, station, give it a high rating so we can honor Scott's story and learn from it and uh, you know, find the purpose and passion that you hear in Scott's voice and live life that you desire and that you deserve. Thank you for listening to The Quiet Warrior Show. Create is a motive-based leadership development firm. www.kreat.ca.